you know, I talked about how to study the Bible, and you'd, you'd really be surprised at people that have been saved for a long time, uh, been in church or even in and out of church, and you ask them the question, how do you study the Bible? And, boy, you'll get some surprising answers. And so it's been on my heart for a month or two for wanting to build this church, you know, this coming year. And I, I think there's some things that will build it. And I believe one of them is, is getting people to study their Bible. Uh, a lot of people read their Bible, and that is important. Um, I've been doing a kind of a, me and Brother Jesse are doing a pretty intense, we agreed on reading through the Bible a certain period of time and it takes, you know, longer than you thought it did and uh, two and a half, three hours a day. But reading the Bible is good, always good for you because the Bible, the Bible is a supernatural book you got to realize uh, it was penned uh, physically by men, but the words in it are from God. Uh, so therefore it makes it a supernatural book with supernatural lessons in it. But I think to get a basic understanding of the Bible will help us greatly in our Christian life. Now I was blessed... When I went to Bible college in 1974, Trinity Baptist College in Jacksonville, Florida, um, I was really blessed to go to that college. I got an absolute amazing four-year uh, Bible education. I mean, I, I'm, it, this is uh, 46 years later, and I still draw from what I learned you know, in Bible college. So what we're going to do, I'm actually going through a book, and I wonder how many of you would like, I could buy uh, these bulk. I can get 10 of these, and they wouldn't cost you but like $9 a book. And it's a book by Tim LaHaye that says how to study the Bible for yourself. And there's just some really good stuff in it. I'm going to use it today. Uh, to give you some things. I really wanted to get here this week and make copies of lessons for you because what I'd like you to do, what I, what they made us do in Bible college, and I've still got them 46 years later, <coughs> is they'd give us notebooks, like little, you know, tree ring notebooks. You put your lessons in them. That way, as you've got your lessons, when you finish that class, you had the notes, you know, for good. So that's what I want to do with you. So I promise you by next Sunday, uh, I will have this week's notes I'm fixing to teach. And uh, then I'll have next week's notes with it. Uh, we're going to take about, we're probably going to take about four Sundays. I've got two in December and two in January. Uh, I think we can do it in those four Sundays and cover the ground that we need to. We need more time, we'll take more time, you know. But, but there's some basic things that I want to cover today. Uh, the first chapter of this book starts off with a wonderful point. It says you can understand the Bible. See, I, I mean, I think a misconception that people have is they, they almost think, you know, I can read it, and but I'm not a preacher, and... I'm not a theologian, I've never been to Bible college, so, you know, I have trouble understanding it. That's not the truth. That's really not the truth. Uh, the King James Bible, the one that we believe is the inspired and found the Word of God, was written on a sixth grade level, academic. So it's written on a level that you can understand it. Now, to understand it, you need to do a couple of things. You need to read it, absolutely, on a regular basis. Uh, I think systematically, I, I think just picking out a place to read, and I mean, I've done it both ways. I just do a lot better when I just start in Genesis and read through and 
start in Matthew and read through that. that I just do better doing that than jumping around, skipping around, reading the book here, the book there, or whatever. But reading it's important, but getting an understanding of how the Bible set up. Okay? Okay, let me, let me just show you what I mean. There's 66 books in the Bible. Okay? From Genesis to Revelation. Now, what, what you need to do is understand that they're broke down in sections. Okay? And in each section, there's a different way that God dealt with man and things were done. Otherwise, the first five books of the Bible uh, are called the books of the law. Okay? Uh, Moses wrote all five of them. Uh, Genesis is really more of a historical book, but you take uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and what you have there is you have a, a history of the nation of Israel and, and how Judaism and the laws, and I'll be honest with you, the boringest book in the Bible to read to me, pray for me, is Leviticus. It's, it, it's, it's really, I know it's God's word, and, and I know for the Israelites it's good, but I read it this week, and it's all about the call and the liver and the kidneys and the sacrifices, and I'm just going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, 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 it, but it serves a purpose. Because what Leviticus does is it sets up the law. So when you go past Leviticus, when you run into sacrifices and feasts and rules that Jews lived under, you'll go back to Leviticus. Because that's where it was set. That's where the skeleton was then the, the Bible puts the meat on it. Uh, when you get into the historical books, uh, that is like 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles. And what's it about? It's about the history of Israel. That's what it does. That's where Saul and David and Goliath and all the historical things happen. So you need to get in your head, this is a, this is a simple outline of the Bible. So, and the reason you do, as you read it, you'll understand that it's speaking, practically it's speaking to everybody. But literally, it's speaking sometimes to a certain set of people. Okay? Because we're not Jews. We don't live under the laws of Judaism. Okay? Uh, and I'm glad we don't because I couldn't eat catfish. Because they couldn't eat fish without scales on. I love, how many of y'all like catfish? I mean, I mean, I do. Lord Jesus, I can eat three good fried ones right now, to be honest with you. But, but, but here's the thing. Uh, for the Jews, God had a reason for that. And that was part of the laws of Judaism. So understanding the whole Bible and getting a picture of what you're... When you read the Gospels... You're reading about the life of Christ. You're reading about Jesus' birth, his life, which we, we really believe uh, was 33, 33 and a half years long, basically. Then when you get in the book of Acts, Acts is a transition book. Don't get, don't get bogged. I'm going to give you notes on all this. We're going we're gonna to go through this next week, matter of fact. But I'm just trying to show you. Acts is a transition book because it goes from the gospel stage to the church age. The church is birthed in Acts, basically. Okay? That's birthed in the gospels originally, but the church itself, as we know it, is in the book of Acts. Then you get into Romans and all them, and they're called pastoral letters. That's where Paul and the men wrote things for. So am I making sense here? If you get an understanding of the whole setup of the Bible, then when you read it or then when you hear it, it will you it, it'll mean more to you. That's what I'm saying. But keep one thing in mind today. You can understand the Bible. And you don't need to be a Greek theologian. See, that's why I don't personally I took Greek in college. I have I have a full Bible college education.
But, but how many times when I'm preaching do you hear me refer to the Greek? Hardly ever, okay? Nothing wrong with that. Some men do it a lot to show a definition that might be a little different, you know. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks also. But uh, the English Bible is on a sixth grade education level and it's not hard to understand. And Satan wants you to think it is. Now, in this book here, I like something he says. I, I went through, I read this whole little book this week, matter of fact. And he, over here, let me just read. Let me read to you. It's a, not real lengthy, but but uh, listen listen to this this uh, three or four paragraphs here. It says the statement was made to a young student who wondered if there was an easier way of learning than to study, but of course there isn't, and the same is true for Bible study. In fact, it takes the hardest kind of work there is thinking, and that is hard for some of us to do. But if you follow the program outlined in this book, you will find the effort well worth it, for you will develop a working knowledge of the Bible that will enrich your spiritual life and will enable you to serve Jesus Christ more effectively. Now here's the paragraph I want to hit today. Here's the main thing I want to get across to you today. And next week we'll get into the setup of the Bible and give you an overall view of it. Uh, pay attention to this. The idea for my method, he says, of study really came to me years ago when I read an advertisement in a magazine that said, learn English in 15 minutes a day. He said, nothing had been harder for me in high school than English. How many of y'all can relate to that? I can. I hated English. Uh, I made a seer better because I didn't want daddy to kill me, but I hated English. But this man showed me it could be mastered in just 15 minutes a day. Actually, you can master almost anything if you do 15 minutes a day and you do it long enough. This program I want to show you would take 30 minutes a day. It would take 15 minutes a day for reading and 15 minutes a day for studying. By the end of three years, you will learn. Uh, and this is what I wanted. And, I, and again, I'll I'll get this I'll get this stuff to you next Sunday. Uh, he, he said, if you do this for three years, otherwise, if you just commit to to, to giving thirty minutes a day for three years, okay, not an hour or two, not three or four hours, thirty minutes a day, and you can do fifteen minutes in the morning. 15 minutes in the evening, you can do 30 at one time, it's up to you. He said, if you do this, here's what will happen to you in three years. You will read the Bible completely through, from Genesis to Revelation. Number two, you'll read several of the key books multiple times. Number three, you'll learn more about the principles of and the promises of scripture. Number four, you'll study some of the important key chapters. Number five, you will learn a multiple set of key verses. And then number, this is the last one. The main thing you will have done is develop a lifetime habit of Bible study that will change your life. Did you hear that? So if you commit to 30 minutes a day and you say, well, I'm doing, come on, there's 24 hours, okay? We're all busy. I know I'm not busy right now too much. I can't do squat, but, but, but we're all busy. I mean, everybody's got work, school, uh, family, friends, but if you want to find 30 minutes a day, you can find it. If it's, a, if, it's, if it's a serious thing to you, you can find it, I guarantee you. I mean, I, I'll guarantee you, I ask it this way. If somebody came to me right now and said, uh, best daughter of Olivia is not going to live unless you figured out a way to do something 30 minutes a day. Uh, Brother Jim, you think you'd find 30 minutes? 
Yeah, I think I would too. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just make it happen. Well, this has to be, this has to be that important to you because it would change your life. Now, I'm going to tell you what I happen ahead of time. What will happen is you'll start doing 30 minutes. But my prophecy is if you do 30 minutes for about six months, it'll slide up to 45 minutes. And probably in a year or two, it'll become an hour a day. Because you'll want to do more and more of it. And you'll see the reason why. So the challenge here that I'm going to make to you is to consider that I'm going to find 30 minutes a day. And I don't care if you do it 15 minutes when you wake up in the morning. 15 minutes before you go to bed at night. I've got a friend of mine uh, he's a pastor and he works a full time job. He does 30 minutes to 45 minutes Bible study every day at lunch. He takes him a sandwich to work. He eats a sandwich and does his Bible study at lunch. So, I mean, there's freedom and there's flexibility because it's your schedule it's your life and it's your burden, okay? So, now here's some things he says that I like there. You say, what do you get from, you know, what what, what do you think Bible study would do for you? Let me ask you first. Do you learn something about my teaching, everybody? Uh, I, when I preach, I lecture and preach. When I teach, I really like involvement. I don't really like to lecture up here for an hour. Uh, I, I want to know your thinking you're participating, you're putting some thought into this thing, okay? So think about this question, then we'll get a couple answers. What do you think are the obvious things that Bible study would do for you? What, by studying the Bible, I don't mean reading it now. We're, we're not talking about just reading it, we're talking about studying the Bible, okay? Part of it is reading, that is part of studying the Bible. But does anybody have any just ideas that some things you think it would do for you if you began to study 30 minutes a day in the Bible? Anybody? Miss Gail? It would strengthen my walk with the Lord. Absolutely. If we gave no more answers, if we gave no more answers, that answer would be enough to do it. It will strengthen your walk with God. Because it is really time with you and him. I mean, there's nobody else there. You're not doing a group study. You're not doing a church service. It's you and the Bible and God. That's what it is. Yeah, great answer, Miss Kim. Anyone else can think of something you just like? No. I feel like a lot of times when I read, it's kind of one ear in, one ear out. You, you, you'll be able to understand more of it. Right. Yeah. And, and what I'm not saying is right, church. I mean, you, you know, and, and, and it's not negative or wrong at all. Uh, I read the Bible. One thing I've done, uh, and really since Josh died last year, I made a commitment to God, and my Bible reading has really went up. I mean, I'm, I'm reading the Bible a lot more than I ever have. But what Nug said was, you feel like, do you feel like sometimes you read a passage and you read it and you don't know what you got out of it? Everybody feels that way. Well, here's the key thing. If you begin to study the Bible, and, and, and if I had a board up here and you had the Bible in the entirety, and you learn the sections again. See, you learn who the verse is talking to. You learn when the verse was written. She's part of studying the Bible, and we'll get into it the next few weeks. If you're, before you look at studying a book, you're going to know who wrote the book. You're going to know what year it was written. You're going to know who it was written to. So therefore, when you read a statement, you're going to have a better chance of understanding. You're going to know more. So 
That's a good answer, nothing. I mean, a very good answer. Because you can read the Bible. I have many times. And, and honestly, quit reading it and, and just, just say, well, I did it, but yeah. But if you study it, it paints the framework for you. And all of a sudden, when you see a phrase over here, and you've studied that phrase, you become familiar with it. And when there's a verse that says that you're being complete, you say, wow, you're being perfect. You know it's not talking about having no sins or, or doing everything. You know it's talking about being mature. Because see, you've studied the Word. You know what the Word means. When the word says reconciliation, if you don't know what that means and you read it, you just, it, it don't stick. But if you know what it means, it means to get people back together. So when you read that phrase, that, that's good, real good answer. Enough. So anyone else have anything? Anyone else have anything? Mother Kevin? Um, the true way to value I, I, I'm half dead. Say that again. A true weighted value of a word. That's so good. I, so if I read a verse, I can pick out every single word in that verse. And a lot of times I like to use a Webster's Dictionary. Word study is the best double, way to study the Bible. Yeah, to double check a word's meaning, not just yeah. assume I know what that yeah. word means. Yeah. Read the, the technical definition of it. Go back yeah. and read the verse. And yeah, we're going to go through all that. But that's really good. We're, we're going to... I'm going to give you, I, I think all you need to study the Bible, really, is a good Bible, a good dictionary, a good concordance, and a Matthew Henry commentary. I really think you could take just those things. You can use other things, I ain't against that. But you could take a good dictionary, a good concordance, which a reference Bible would saying that does, like a Thompson or chain reference, you know, whatever. And you can study the Bible. So it does put more weight to the words because the words, when when you understand what they mean, see, when you look at the word, okay, let me just show you one. I was reading this week through the book of Exodus, and it said that Moses was a meek man. Now let's just talk about that man. When you think of meek, Somebody said he's a meek person. What do you think of? <clears throat> Brother Jim? Excessive power under control. That's the definition. You cheated on me. But when you think of meek, when you when, when people think of the word meek, what is your first thought, Norman? Gentle. Miss Helen? He said it. Gentle. 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 Yes, ma'am. Uh, Brother, Brother Jim gave the definition. It's what meek is, is power under control. But what I was getting at, though, in our day, we don't use meek that way. Somebody tell me when you think of meek in our day, when somebody says he's a meek person, what's your first thought? Sissy. Huh? Sissy. Sissy. Quiet. Quiet, you know, unassuming, um, but it's totally different. The word means Moses was no sissy. Moses was no was no quiet, introverted man. He he had, he had power, but it was under control. See, Jesus was meek. Jesus had more power. I mean, let's face it: when Jesus died on the cross, he could have flipped his little finger and destroyed the whole Roman Empire. He could have brought a legion, a legion of angels down. So he had power. But it, like Brother Jim said, he was under control. So see, when you start doing word studies like that, the Bible opens up to you. Does that make sense? See, and, and here's something you've got to understand. And I just did it with me, okay? An another one is perfect. Okay? Keep in mind that the Bible was written in perfect Elizabethan English. We don't tell it that way. In case you didn't know, okay? So sometimes when we read a word in the Bible, our 
thought of what it means. Uh, perfect illustration, hope. H-O-P-E, hope. When we use that word, here's how we use it. I hope, I hope the Gators lose. And they did. Not as much as I wanted to, but they did. I hope it's going to rain today. Now, now what that means, we say that, that means it might, it might not. But the Bible don't mean that. The word hope in the Bible means it may be something that hasn't happened yet. And you may not have seen it, but it will. That's what the word hope means. So you've got to understand by doing these word definitions of what the Bible says, when you read a verse like Nug was talking about and you understand those words, okay, they're going to jump at you. See, you're going to say, why? That's good. You know, it's just like when Jesus said, be tender hearted. And that doesn't mean that anybody run over you. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying to be tender if you can. Be kind instead of the other way. Okay? So so words are going back. I just tell you, word studies in the Bible is going to be the best way to study the Bible. That's what's going to really open the Bible up to you. When you study the words and you see what they are and what they mean, you're going to understand it. Okay? I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. And, and uh, when you see Pharisees, you're going to know that Pharisees were religious leaders. They were full of themselves. They were very proud, arrogant, condescending people. And that's what a Pharisee means. And by the way, the only people Jesus was mean to was them. If you notice that. He was never mean to a sinner. He was never judgmental of a harlot or an out drunk. Or no, he was never that way. He was always understanding. He was loving. He was caring. He was kind. I mean, they brought the woman to him, and they said she's been caught, and he sits down in the sand and writes her sins or something, and all of a sudden they're all gone, and he says to her, woman, where's your abuser? She said, they're gone. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Jesus never condemned a sinner. Never. Not one time. But he did condemn Pharisees who thought they were better than people who were teaching religious dogmas ahead of real truth because that was a bigger danger to society and hurt people more than it helped them at all. But here's the things. I've got five minutes to give you these. And again, I'll, I'll have them printed up. Uh, next Sunday when you come, you'll have all these. Here's what he said Bible study does for you. He said, number one, Miss Gill pretty well said this, it will make you a strong Christian. Number two, it will assure you of your salvation. The more you get in the Bible, the more you see the truth of God and the truth of His Word is the more you'll be sure of your salvation. Okay? Number three, it will give you confidence and power in prayer. As you study the Bible, you'll see how real it is. You'll see what God has done what he will do, what he says he'll do, and it gives you more confidence. That's what it does. Uh, number four, it will cleanse you from sin. See, reading the Bible, reading the Bible is kind of like, the way I look at it, reading the Bible is kind of like putting a spotlight on Ed Strickland's heart. See, I can compare myself to bad people and feel pretty good. Right? I mean, there's some bad, evil people around right now. If I compare myself to them, Brother Morris, I'd do okay, right? But when you compare yourself to God in the Bible, you don't do quite so all right, do you? Because it shows you your sins. It shows you what needs to change, and it shows you how to do it. It don't just show you what's wrong. It shows you how to change what is wrong. So, so studying the Bible 
will help cleanse you from sin. I mean, you 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 be struggling. You know how many times I've been struggling with something. I was struggling this week with something with my family. I, there's a decision I had to make, and 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 honestly, my flesh. You know, there's Ed and there's brother Ed. By the way, you know, there's two of there's two of all of us. There's there's the old Ed. He's unsaved, and there's the brother Ed. And he's saved, and the old Ed and the brother Ed have some battles. They really do. And the old Ed didn't want to do what I knew I should do. And it took me from Saturday night to Friday night to do it. But I knew it was the right thing to do. How did I know it was the right thing to do? Because the Word of God and the word of God is a final authority. And then he finished up by saying it will guide you in making important decisions in your life. See, you, I mean, I mean, and, and here's the thing, church class. Life, period, is about decisions. Life is about decisions. Who you hang with, where you go, what you do, what you don't do, what you eat, where you work, it's all decisions. So if you're studying the Bible, if you're studying the Bible every day, you're going to stand a better chance of making right decisions. Does that make sense? If you're studying the Bible every day and you're making decisions every day, then somewhere down there, you're going to say, you know, I shouldn't do that. You know, I should do that. It just works that way. It just works that way. I mean, the closer to God you get, uh, the more of your sins you see that need to be changed. <coughs> the more light in the room, the more responsibility Okay? So I hope you got something out of that today. And next Sunday I'll have this set of lessons ready for you. Then next Sunday we'll, we will take the Bible. Remember I told you about grouping it together and how it's separated and how it's put apart. Uh, here it is right here. I'll have a chart for you and uh, we'll go through the entire 66 books of the Bible and we'll see where they belong and we'll see the different, let's use a big word to make you think about it all way. We'll see the different dispensations. Okay? Say, so what is that, preacher? That is a period of time that God dealt with man a certain way. That's what a dispensation is. Okay? We're not in, we're not in the gospel dispensation. We're not in Israel's dispensation. We're in the church age dispensation. That's what we're in, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. Try to get some folks to come next week. We're going to get a roll next week. We're going to try to build the class up and get a lot more people. I had some more promises today, and uh, I'm going to be working on them. And Cameron, you'll become the class secretary, you said. So I'll get you a roll book, get everybody's information, and we'll go from there. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Sunday school this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to preach and teach how precious and important your word is. Thank you, Lord, for the hunger that some folks seem to have, that they want to study the Bible, they want to learn how to study it. Help them, man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.